If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians 1. We are continuing our series through the book of Colossians. We're going to finish chapter 1 today. Uh, we saw last week Paul kind of shifted his gears. The first few weeks we looked at his prayer, we looked at his thanksgiving. And last week he kind of shifted over and began to explain his purpose for writing the Colossian church. And remember, the whole purpose of the book of Colossians is that Jesus is supreme, Jesus is sufficient. Those are his purposes that he's writing. He's telling them, Jesus is enough. You don't need anything else because Jesus is enough. That's what he's telling them. This week, he's going to tell us what it looks like to be effective in ministry. Now, before we get started, we need to define what ministry is. Because there are several people sitting here who would say, ministry, that's that thing that you do for a living. That's that thing that Pastor Dave did for a lot of years and is doing still today. That's that thing that Pastor Steve or, or Jeff and Tasha or John and Destiny do. But that is wrong. When, when you think about ministry, we think about like last week at camp, we had a call to the ministry service. And we said to the, to the kids and the teenagers, if you feel like you're being called into the ministry, then, then come up to the front. We want to pray over you. And so what, what were we looking for? We were looking for teachers, evangelists, missionaries, pastors, worship leaders. We were looking for those things, yes. But I loved how each week when we called that up, we said, now listen, just because these people are up here doesn't mean everybody's not called into the ministry because everyone has a call to be in the ministry you may never preach from a pulpit you may never teach to anybody else but you are called to minister preaching is really only a small part of ministry if that's the only ministry you get or you do each week you are not doing things Right. The truth is, each and every one of us have a ministry, and Jesus called us not to just come and, and sit around, but He called us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So the question we need to ask ourselves today is, are we following that command? Are we making disciples? There's one area... I feel like I've failed as a pastor, and there's probably a lot of areas I've failed as a pastor. But the one area that I look back on most often is discipleship. Because I can see people, and I don't know if this is just a pastor thing, maybe you guys have this same experience. But I can look back, and I remember 2020, uh, when COVID happened, we had to shut down the church uh, for a few weeks, the, the district made that decision for us, being a district council church. And so I remember we were empty in here, and I was preaching to a camera that was right out in the middle. And what we did so we felt like people were in here was we put names on every, where everybody sat, your name was there in the seat. And so I could look and I would say, okay, you know, Right there is Rob and Maria's seat. And I would look over just like Rob and Maria were sitting there when I was preaching. Because who wants to just stare at a camera for 40 minutes or whatever? And so I see those in my head still. I see in my head faces of people and where they sit. And I can tell you. And I'm not talking about people who left to go worship somewhere else. That's not what we're talking about here today. Sometimes people are led away from a church to go minister somewhere else. That's okay. I'm talking about the people who are sitting in these pews who we don't see anymore. And they're not going anywhere and they have zero Jesus in their life. Those are the people that I think of, and those are the people that keep me awake at night. Those are the people who I think, is there anything I could have done to keep them in God? 
And part of it's a societal problem. Part of it, we've made Jesus about praying a prayer at the altar, getting baptized, and you're good the rest of your life. And we see as we, the, the more I read the Bible, the more I realize what nonsense that is. It's nonsense. Jesus never expected us to just pray a prayer, continue in our own life after getting baptized, and keep doing whatever it is. He wanted us to mature, and we're going to see that in this passage today. I, I think about Judgment Day, and I think about some of the faces of people who have been here. And, and I think, you know, what's God going to say on Judgment Day? If they're not going somewhere else, if, they're, if they went back to that life, what am I going to say on Judgment Day as I watch them being judged? And, and I truly believe when, when you read in Revelation, it talks about He's going to wipe away every tear from your eye. I truly believe that's what that is about because why else would you be crying? You're in heaven. You're with God. It's going to be regret. It's going to be shame. It's going to be, man, I wish I could have done more to, to win these people, to disciple them, to get them to be right here and in the same place that I am. And, and so those things haunt me as a pastor. I don't know if they haunt you, but if they don't haunt you, you ought to check your relationship with Christ because that's what we're here for, to win as many people as we can to heaven. He says, go into all the world, make disciples. Who can disciple? Anyone. Who can be discipled? Everyone. None of us are too far above being discipled. None of us are are. are, are too short in our walk to disciple somebody. And so I kind of compare discipling to this. I, I watched NASCAR for many years until I got really bored with it. Really, the way I would watch it was I would, I would sit in my chair, watch about 15 laps, go to sleep, and wake up for about the last 15 laps, which are the most exciting. Anybody watch NASCAR? Yeah, a few people in here. There's this awesome thing in NASCAR. There, there's super speedway races like Talladega and Daytona. Those are the most exciting races because you don't know who's going to win. And so sometimes somebody who's never won a race before will win those. And it's interesting to me to see how they do it because you can have a slow car that has never won a race at any other track and they get to a big track like that where all these cars are lined up and they're able to tuck in behind a car that's faster than them and the two cars can go faster together. Sometimes they get in big long lines and you got like 30 cars and 15 on the other side going. And, and they are able to go faster together. Why? Because they're tucked in behind somebody who's faster. The lead car is the fastest one, but he can't get away because everybody else is tucked in behind. It's called the draft. And it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting to watch a race. Like you'll, you'll think at NASCAR, this guy's got it won. And before long, they'll fall in behind each other. They'll get in the draft again. And they're pushing each other uh, to the start-finish line to win. That's what discipleship is. It's getting behind somebody who's doing better in their walk than you, and it's following them as they follow Christ. That's what discipleship is. And, and so in the draft, you say, why does everything so fast? Because there's less resistance, there's less wind. When you're following somebody closely, when, they're, when you're learning from them, there's less resistance in the world. You can, you can talk to them about things. You can share it. What do we do now? Well, I'm just going to post on Facebook what my problem is. How many of your atheist friends comment, well, where's Jesus right now? You know, things. No, if you've got somebody who's in the faith that you can go to and talk to, the resistance is less. You're both going to go farther together than you ever could on your own. Discipleship is commanded by Jesus, and discipleship is effective and necessary for all believers. 
What makes an effective discipleship ministry? Paul tells us in this passage in Colossians 1. Colossians 1, beginning at verse 24, he says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. First thing Paul says is, is effective discipleship begins with joy. Begins with joy. Paul found great joy in ministering to others about Jesus. That was a passion of his life. He, he loved doing that. It, it wasn't his occupation. If you, if you read, he says, I worked. I, he, he made tents. Paul was a tent maker. He said, I did these things. I didn't take a dime from you. It was his passion. It was what he did. And, and you think about Paul's ministry in Acts. Every single place he went, he was harassed by somebody. Every single place he went, he was arrested or beat or, or had these different issues come up. If they weren't stoning him, they were dragging him before the local courts, putting him on trial. And Paul had an awful, awful time in his ministry. In 2 Corinthians 11.24, he gives his resume. Listen to this. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, less one. Well, that's great. That's, that's what I want, right? Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. At night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, Danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Any one of those things in our lives today, in our relationship with Christ, and in what we think it means to follow Christ, any one of those things comes up, and what are we doing? God... Are you even there? Are you doubting? Are, 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 we start doubting. God, God, are you there? Are you not hearing? Are you not taking care of me? If you were here, if you were taking care of me, then all these things wouldn't be happening to me. That's what we do. God, look at this nation. Are, are you even out there? God, look at what's going on here. Is, is, it, is it even possible you're on the throne? And we begin to doubt. That's not what Paul did. He's going through all these things, and he says, he says, I am rejoicing that I'm going through all these things. Now, I'm sure he wasn't happy. He's like, oh, yeah, you're bringing the rod again. Woo, I can't wait for that. No, he's, but he's happy that he's going through this stuff because Christ is right there with him, and he sees the bigger picture. I, I heard a pastor one time say, don't let your meology affects your theology and we live in a very me-centered society what have you done for me lately everything is about me selfies right we take selfies what's that about me putting me out there not saying there's anything wrong with selfies it's just a sign of our time john macarthur said this people lose their joy when they become self-centered, thinking they deserve better circumstance or treatment than they are getting. That's how you lose your joy, because you look around at what everybody else is doing. Some of us play that comparison game. Well, God's really blessing that person. God, why aren't you blessing me like that? And we lose our joy. That's not what happened to Paul. He had his joy all through those afflictions. Paul went through way more than you or I will probably ever go through. But not once did he lose his joy. His faith wasn't dictated by his circumstances. His faith dictated his circumstances. His circumstances were dictated by his faith. It was just the opposite. He trusted God through everything that was going on. He didn't question God. He trusted Him even when He was going through all these things. Paul was too busy discipling people to bother to question his faith. 
He's writing all these churches. Look, most of the New Testament's written by Paul. What's he doing? Discipling people. That's what his letters are doing. He's, he's discipling the ones he's with. He's writing letters to those who are not. Rather than whining and complaining that he's facing persecution, he's sitting there and he's praising God and he's discipling people. If you want to disciple people effectively, you've got to learn to have joy in the midst of persecution. You've got to have joy in the midst of your heartaches. And, and it's not a situation where you say, oh, praise God, I've got terminal cancer. But it's a circumstance where you say, man, I've got terminal cancer, but praise God, he's still on the throne. And even if he takes me here, I've got eternal life in heaven. That's joy in the midst of your circumstances. It's not that you may enjoy those circumstances. I don't think, you know, Paul was getting beaten saying, you know, thank you, sir, can you give me one more? No, it, but he's there and he's going through it. Why? Because it means he's advancing the gospel. It means he's having an impact. Remember, when you're going through trials, when you're going through hardship, God's still on the throne. Jesus wins. I don't know if you've read to the end of the book. Guess what? I just finished Revelation yesterday. He wins. I hate to spoil that for you. Jesus wins. You say, what about that sickness? What about that stuff that I'm going through? What did Jesus say to his disciples about Lazarus? This sickness doesn't lead to death. Your sickness doesn't lead to death if you're a believer. Your sickness may lead to eternal life. It may lead to an end of your earthly life, but it's the start of a heavenly life. God still wins. When we're discipling, we've got to be joyful so that we can lead people into joy. You've heard me say this a lot. If I'm in a bad mood in the morning and I'm taking the kids to school, everybody's in a bad mood. Why? Because my mood dictates the mood of those around me. Your mood dictates the mood of those around you. You may not believe it, but it does. Just, just stop and listen. Heather's mood will dictate the mood of our whole family. <laughs> she was grumpy one morning. I became grumpy. She said, why are you grumpy? And I said, I don't know. I guess because you're grumpy. Why are you grumpy? She said, I don't know. And I said, well, let's stop being grumpy then. <laughs> When you're discipling somebody, if you're walking in complaining about God, what are they going to do? Complain about God. If you're joyful in whatever it is that you're going through, what are they going to learn? Be joyful in every circumstance. And so, when we're discipling, we have to maintain that joy that God puts in us. You can't do it on your own. That joy is a fruit of the Spirit, and it grows over time. And, and maybe day one, you know, when you are saved, you're not going to feel that joy. But over time, you're going to experience that joy. It's going to grow in you if everything's going right, if the fruit's growing properly. One thing I need to say about this passage, because some people have twisted it, and some people uh, like to take Paul's words and twist them around. When Paul said he was filling up what was lacking in Christ's afflictions, here's what you need to know. He didn't mean that he was adding to the value of Christ's work on the cross. Christ's work on the cross is finished. That's not what he meant there. What Paul is saying is, when you stand up for Christ in this world, you're going to face persecution. It may not be a rod. It may not be uh, that you're boiled in hot water. But you're going to face persecution. Somebody may make fun of you. Somebody may give you a hard time. Paul is experiencing this very thing that Jesus Christ told us to expect. Jesus said, you're going to face that in this world. Because of me, you're going to suffer things that you wouldn't if you didn't have me. And so God has appointed us not only to believe in Christ, but to suffer joyfully for His name. This isn't popular preaching, is it? But it's what the Word says. 
1 Peter 4.13 says this, But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. That's not a power verse we want to hear. No, I want to hear, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Could you preach that a couple times, Pastor? Well, I could. But guess what? It's not the full gospel. There's so much more in the Bible about people suffering with joy than there is God changing circumstances just because they pray. We'd rather skip these verses that talk about suffering, but they make up the bulk of the New Testament and the Old Testament. If we have a true relationship with Jesus Christ, we can glory in the trials, we can glory in the tribulations, we can find joy in whatever it is that we're going through because we have a God who's been through it too. He's been tempted in all ways that we have, and He's right there with us, right in the heat of the fire. Second thing, effective discipleship focuses on the Word of God. Colossians 1.25 says, it continues, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul said God wants us to steward his word. What does steward mean? Steward just means to manage it. A steward is a a manager. What's a manager? A manager is responsible for making decisions and keeping charge of things when the owner's gone, right? If you're a manager at Wendy's, your job is to make sure the store's running smoothly to make the owner happy, to get the sales in, to do things like, like he would want it. Paul's stewardship, he says, is to bless the body of Christ. How? By bringing God's Word back to them in its fullness and its sufficiency to meet all their needs. That's what he says. This this is the purpose. He didn't hold anything back. He used God's Word to encourage them when they were discouraged. He used God's Word to correct them when they needed correction. He used God's Word uh, to teach and to preach to them. We see him using God's Word over and over and over. It's interesting to read through the New Testament. And they're quoting the Old Testament. Many times you'll read something in there that they quoted from the Old Testament. They're returning God's Word. They're teaching them. They're giving them hope. They're saying, this is your hope. It's in the Word of God. Too many pastors today talk about their own lives. There's nothing wrong with giving a sermon illustration. I do that occasionally. You know, I'll illustrate a point by something that's happened. But have you ever heard a pastor preach? And I'm like, is this about Jesus or is this about him? I've heard messages that, that I think are more uh, appropriate for a platform at a political rally. I mean, because there's no Bible in there. They're not talking about the moral issues. There are some politics that are moral issues. But they're talking about like, you know, here's what we ought to do with welfare. Here's what we ought to do with immigration. I'm like, what, what does that have to do with, with what Jesus says in his word here? And it's just a whole pulpit full of propaganda. Sometimes we have small groups. We don't have small groups here at this church. But I've heard of people who join small groups and they're like, man, my small group was really awesome when it began. We were learning the Word of God, but but now what happens is we've been in this small group for quite some time and and really it's more kind of a gossip session or really it's more about uh, sharing about what's going on at church or, or just socializing. None of those are effective ministries. From the pulpit in a small group, none of its effect. What is an effective ministry? An effective ministry is centered on the Word of God. Paul's in prison. Paul is under the oppression of Rome, which is one of the worst 
societies that was, would have been set up in that time. They crucified Jesus for heaven's sake. That's how bad Rome was. And here we have Paul sitting in jail, and he's not writing for social reform. He's not, he's not asking Christians to march on Rome and protest. He's not talking about his family. He's not, he's not talking about all his friends other than just kind of in passing or as an illustration. What's he doing? He's writing about the Word of God. He's correcting, he's, he's feeding the church the precious truth that is in this book. Because that's what matters. That's what effective ministry is. That's what effective discipleship is. It's teaching God's Word. That's what God has called us to do when we disciple other people. is to teach them God's Word. The weather's a great topic introduction. How's the weather? Great. If you spend an hour meeting with somebody talking about the weather, that is pointless. You've got to focus on God's Word. That's what He's saying here. We need to do all we can to get the Word of God out there. People are being deceived. There are churches in this area that will not preach the Word of God. Why? Because they want... Rear ends in seats. They want people to come, and if they speak out against certain topics, if they say, you know, well, the Word of God doesn't really address homosexuality, they're wrong. The Word of God addresses you. You've got to teach the Word of God. You can't avoid hot-button issues. You've got to preach the whole truth. Some people won't do that. Why? Well, we want rear ends in seats. Somebody will get offended. Somebody's going to leave. no. The power is when you teach this word. Because the power is not in my words. The power is not in, in political correctness. The power is not in, in rear ends and seats. The power is in this word of God. And so that's important that when you teach, you are teaching the word of God. This is what drives the church right here. This book. This is what drives the church is this book. And it's got to be taught. Don't, don't get sidetracked. Don't, don't get off on sports. When you're discipling somebody, focus on the Word. Biblical ministry is shepherding, teaching, preaching, ministering from this book. It's an awesome responsibility God's put on us. But it's also an unbelievable privilege. Uh, I, I sometimes catch myself and I'll say, I have to preach Sunday. And one day, one time somebody called me out and he goes, no, no, no. You don't have to preach. You get to preach. And so I catch myself if I say, oh, I got to preach. You know, No, no, I get to preach. I change that got to get. Because it's a, it's a responsibility. It can be hard at times. But I get to do it. I get to preach what God puts on my heart. You get to say what God puts on your heart. It's a, it's a responsibility, but it's a privilege too. Can you believe that's how God chose it? Would you have picked you to spread the gospel? I wouldn't have picked me, but that's what God did. He chose us, you and me, to, to go and make disciples. He didn't say, okay, this group right here, they've got eternal life on earth. They're going to make disciples the rest of the time. No, he said, those people who follow me, their job's to go make other people who follow me. It's awesome responsibility, but it's also an awesome privilege that God thought that much about me. That he entrusted me with that. What's he talking about? This mystery. The mystery he's talking about is how God revealed, especially through Paul, that all of the words of the Old Testament, all of God's plan, wasn't just for the Jews, but it was for the Gentiles too. And he, he revealed that a lot through Paul. Paul was one of the first to go and, and preach to the Gentiles. And so that's the mystery that it's talking about. God's chosen people are just not Israel anymore. God's God loves Jews, God loves Gentiles, God loves black, God loves white, God loves Republican, God loves Democrat, God loves all of those different characteristics. 
praise God that, that he, he allowed us Gentiles to, to come into his kingdom, that he shared with us that kingdom, and, and he gives us that forgiveness. He gives us that redemption that we're able to have through Jesus Christ. Christ in you is the hope of glory. That's the ministry. He's, that's the mystery he's talking about. He gets to share. When you accept Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. You have God inside of you. And if that's not exciting, I don't know what is. You have God right there. And it's uncomfortable at times because when we hang on to our sin, God's a little uncomfortable with that. And that's why you feel weird when you're sitting here in service and you're holding on to sin. It's because that's the Spirit of God inside of you saying, what are you doing? Third thing, effective discipleship equips believers. The whole purpose of discipling is to equip somebody to follow Christ when you're not around. You're not going to disciple somebody forever. You're going to have a limited time when you can disciple somebody. And so you want to equip them. And verse 28 is the best verse that I can think of to describe what discipleship is. You say, I don't even know what you're talking about, discipleship. Look at verse 28. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. He says, Five elements there. We're going to look at them real quickly. He says, These are, this is what discipleship is. What's our message? We proclaim God. It's, it's not, a, not a law, not an opinion, not a psychology. It's not a philosophy. It, it's, it's not a tip for how to live right or healthy. We proclaim a living God. That's what we proclaim. Jesus Christ all that Paul has told us about Christ, we proclaim. All that we learn in the New Testament, we proclaim. That's what we proclaim. It's not like you ignore the Old Testament. You know, the Old Testament is about Jesus too. The Old Testament just points forward to Jesus. The whole book is about Him. And so we proclaim God. It's not a theory. It's not a system. It's a living God. That's the object who do we disciple? It says everyone. Every believer. Now, you're not going to disciple an unbeliever. You're going to witness to that person. There's a difference. The Greek word that's used here includes men and women, boys and girls. Everyone gets discipled. Every believer Every believer is to be discipled. God's truth is for every believer. God's truth is actually for everyone if they accept it, but it's for sure for every believer. So if you're a Christian, then, then you are to be discipling everyone. Everyone who wants to be discipled. Everyone you can. Now you can't, you can't, you know, okay, I'm going to disciple everyone in this church. No, you don't have time for that. You pick two or three people. Maybe one at a time even. Start with one. See where it takes you. Disciple them. Paul gives us two words that summarize the ministry of the word. He says, I warn them. Warning is the idea that God's word is going to have an effect on your conscience. God's word is going to have an effect on your actions. Oh no, we don't go to church for that. That's judging. You know, hey, judge not lest you judge. Now, he says we warn them. You're not condemning them. You're not saying you're going to hell for this. You're warning them. You're saying, hey, young person, I know what y'all are doing at night after hours. You know that can lead to babies. I don't know if you made it that far in biology or you just kept listening to the pleasure part. You know that can lead to these things down the road. You know that can lead to a split household. You're warning them. You're saying, here's what God's Word says. You see one of the people you're discipling taking a wrong turn. Your job is to warn them, right? If, if, if we have right out here this bridge, and it's out, and we know it's out, and we see people driving 60 miles an hour like they do towards that bridge, should we just stand and go, boy, I bet that one's going to be awful. 
Man, I bet that one's going to be a big wreck. No, you'd be out there going, hey, hey, stop. The bridge is out. You're going to die. That's what warning is. It's not that you're saying, hey, pal, you're going to hell if you don't change your ways. No, you're war- this is what God's Word says. These are the ramifications of this. You're teaching. You're warning. He says that's a part of it. In Acts 20.31, listen to this. It says, Paul warned or admonished, as the term is in the ESV, I think, the Ephesian elders. So those are the leaders of the church. Paul warned them for three years. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't want to hang out with Paul. No, they loved him. They absolutely, he spoke truth to them. You need truth in your life. It's our word for for counseling when it says warned or admonished. You're you're visiting, you're letting people know when someone is struggling with a problem and you sit down and share God's word about that problem, you're speaking life into them. They may listen or they may not, but you know what the word says? It's not going to return void. Fourth, says teaching with all wisdom so that's the instructive side do you wonder why i go through books of the bible at a time do you wonder why we have bible study on on wednesday night it's because there's power in this word and we need to understand it and so we go through it and and that's discipling we teach the things in this book we teach the things christ taught us We teach the things Paul wrote. We teach the Old Testament. We show them the prophecies. We teach them all of those things. And we apply it to their lives and to our own lives. We say, this is what I went through in this situation. You may be going through that too. Here's how God delivered me. Here's what His Word says. Here's how He delivered me. That's teaching. That's instructing. And and so... Paul would say there's nothing better than this privilege of teaching people. He says, what's the purpose of discipleship? The purpose is to equip God's people to move toward maturity in Christ. There are a whole lot of places that tickle ears. There are a whole lot of places you will come, you'll get a feel-good message, you walk out and you're like, what did I just hear? I don't know, but it sounded pretty good. I love that. I'm coming back next week. Love the music. Boy, that was awesome. Like a worship concert. What's the purpose? What's the purpose of any ministry? What's the purpose of church? What's the purpose of discipleship? To grow somebody in Christ. You've heard me say this before. Ella's three years old. If she's still a little baby being fed with a bottle changing diapers at three almost four years old in a few months there's a problem right yet why do we have churches full of people walking around in diapers and drinking bottles it's a problem because our focus is not on what it should be our focus is on money in the offering plate our focus is on rear end in seats And there's nothing wrong with people coming to Christ. There's nothing wrong with people coming to church. We want our church to grow. Hear me on that. But we want people to grow in their walk too. That's the purpose. It's the purpose. And and that's what he says. We're equipping God's people to move toward maturity. Our job is not just to win them. Our job is not just to get them to raise their hand for a salvation message, to get them to come to the altar, to get them to pray a prayer. Our goal is not even to get them into that baptismal right there. Our goal is that over time they mature in Christ. They don't go back to that old life. How does it happen? Well, it starts right here on Sunday morning with the preaching of the Word. And then it happens throughout the week. If it's just happening on Sundays and Wednesdays, something's wrong. It ought to be happening every single day of the week. Every day of the week, somebody ought to be discipled. We have a duty to disciple people in our lives. I have that duty. You have that duty. You say, I I don't think I know too much about Jesus. I don't know enough to disciple somebody. Guess what? There's somebody that knows less than you. 
And if you don't know, you say, hey, Pastor Jeremy, talk to me about this thing. Can you explain this to me so I can explain it to somebody else? See, we, there were 10 of us that attended a discipleship conference back in February, and it was awesome. And, and that's what they told us was, was you begin discipling with somebody, and then you pass along to another person what you receive from them. What you get from that person, you pass along. And so they, they just need to be a step or two behind you. You can't disciple somebody, you know, who, who's, who's way up here spiritually in your eyes if you're way down here that that's that's not the way it works you you find somebody behind you and you disciple them ought to happen every single day of the week every believer ought to be growing every believer ought to be maturing in christ we we hadn't ought to have people come in living the same life they lived 30 years ago the day before they accepted Christ, there ought to be a maturing process. There ought to be a, a walk that's getting closer. Every believer should be growing and maturing in Christ. Every believer ought to be getting a step closer to heaven every single day. Not just in age, but in maturity. The bottom line of ministry is you've got to have joy to do all that. He said that's the first thing you've got to have. I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. He says, I labor for your joy. If, if you aren't joyful, you're going to have a hard time sharing it with others. You ought to be so full of joy, you're ready to disciple somebody else. It's not a duty. It's not a chore. It's, it's a privilege that you get to do. But it's work. Colossians 1.29 says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. Discipling is work. It takes labor. When you go to disciple somebody, and you're sitting down with them for coffee or whatever at 8 o'clock in the morning, you're going through a chapter of the Bible. You better have studied that chapter of the Bible. You better have, have at least read it, understand it, looked at the commentary. You ever expect me to just get up here and just, okay, I've never read this passage before in the Bible, but, but let's preach on Zechariah 6. Never studied it. You know what? That'd be an awful message. Well, the Lord would lead you through it. Yeah, the Lord would lead me through it. And you'd say, man, that was an awful message, but praise God, the Lord got him through it. You've got to study. You've got to put time in. It's work. You don't just wing it with 10 minutes of preparation and say, oh, I hope God does this for me. Young people, if you take a test that way, you're going to fail. I know because I tried it. <laughs> I prayed before every test I took that I hadn't studied for. God, just get me through this one. Guess what? He didn't. Why? Because I didn't put the work in. God doesn't work. That. God, you got to work. God will help you. You got to work. <laughs> you got to put in the time. Paul said, I toil. He said, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy. Wait a minute, who's his? His? You say, I'm tired, I don't have time to disciple. It's work. But you're not using your energy. It says you're using his energy. He will give you the strength to do it. There are times I think I cannot get up and preach. This morning was one of those, believe it or not. Thinking, man, I'm tired. We did a bed build yesterday. I took a 45-minute nap. I packed my stuff. I, I, I stayed up working on my message last night till about 1.30. I did not want to get up this morning. Oh, God's given me some energy. He'll give you energy to make it through. Paul says, I toil, but it's not in my own strength. He says, I struggle with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. 1 Peter 4.11 says this, Whoever serves, let him do so as by the strength which God supplies, so that God might be glorified through Christ. Paul found joy in ministering to others. Paul found joy in equipping others. Paul found joy in discipling people. 
You know, since I came here in 2019, we've had a vision statement as to, to be a beacon of light to the community, leading the lost home. We got five ways we do that. We, we say we're going to be the light, we're to love others, we're to impact community, we're to grow ourselves, we're to honor God, we're to tell others. That's a lot to remember. When I come back from vacation, when I get that website, you're going to see two simple things. What does our church exist to do? Win the lost, disciple people. That's it. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go into all the world and what? Make disciples. We're to win the lost. We're to disciple people. Simple. Listen, you say, I want to change the world. You're not going to do it with a Facebook post. You're going to do it winning people to Christ and discipling them. You can't do one without the other. You win somebody, what happens so many times? You win them Sunday morning, Satan attacks Monday. Satan attacks Tuesday. Satan attacks, when, Satan attacks a year down the road. I've seen people attend faithfully for a year and then they're gone. What happened? Satan attacked them. There was no discipleship. They didn't know how to handle it. You cannot do one without the other. They go hand in hand. You say, I can't disciple that person. The person I won was, was a relative of mine. They won't listen to me. Then get somebody else to disciple them. Say, hey, Pastor Steve, would you disciple this person? Hey, Pastor Jeremy, would you disciple this person? That's what it takes to change a world. And if Jesus tarries, we need a world to change. You know that? <laughs> If he comes back tomorrow, praise God. If he doesn't, we need a changed world.